This is the Unsung Interview, introducing the sports stars you don't know, telling the stories you can't miss. My name is Alexis James, and in this episode, I speak with the man whose creative flourish over 30 years ago left an indelible mark on Europe's elite football tournament. His name is Tony Britton, and he's the composer responsible for this. I spoke to Tony ahead of the 2023 Champions League final between Manchester City and Inter Milan. He told me what it was like to silence the San Siro, how he wound up Stefan Effenberg on German TV, and why Man City fans need to grow up. Tony's words, not mine. But first, a little background on the man responsible for sport's most famous anthem. A graduate of the Royal College of Music, Tony began his career working with the likes of Cameron McIntosh, Mel Smith and Bob Hoskins on theatre productions including The Rocky Horror Show, Oliver and Guys and Dolls, before he moved into film and TV. Then, in 1992, he was approached by UEFA, which is where we pick up the conversation. What were you doing when this UEFA job turned up then? What were, what were your other gigs at that I, time? Oh God, you know, it's such a long time ago. I've got the diary there somewhere. I was doing lots of bits of telly. I was doing quite a lot of commercials, and that's how I got the gig, because the, the woman who was then my commercials agent, she must have been approached by the people at Team Marketing, who were the people who set up the Champions League, effectively, for UEFA. She came to me and said, there's a job writing some football theme. And I thought, okay, well, fine. Did they approach you? You didn't have to pitch for it with other, there wasn't a competition? No. I mean, can you imagine it? Now, I'd I'd have to pitch. Yeah, it just came through. So what were you doing at the time that Someone at UEFA had gone, oh, well, this is the guy for us. Was there any... I don't... Any... See, I, don't I, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> but I, I, the only bit of the brief was they... It was not long after the um, three tenors thing with the World Cup. And so and suddenly football and classical music was yeah. all the rage. But so they'd been in, inspired by yeah. the success of Pavarotti and the three tenors yeah. and N- yeah. Nessun Dorma at Italia 90. They thought this was the, the business. The only thing they knew was what they, they didn't want, which they didn't want solo voices. So I said, well, then you want a choir? And they said, oh, do we? And they, well, yeah. How detailed was the was the brief? Did you oh, ever know, know what they wanted? Or No. I to persuade them, well, you've got to have a choir then, and the choir and orchestra, great. So I think they asked for some ideas. So I just put together a cassette of pieces of choral music, stuff from Handel's Messiah, Dream of Gerontius, you know, Big choral stuff that, that most people would recognise. And one of the elements was Zadok the Priest, the coronation anthem from Handel. I wasn't present in any of this. It got sent off. And then they came back and they said uh, they, they really liked the Handel and Zadok. And I thought, okay, well, now I kind of see what they're trying to do. Okay, and I've borrowed the... There's a rising string phrase. So Handel's phrase goes... Uh, mine goes. Which is completely different, but it's in the same key and it kind of reminds you. And it clearly reminds people because apparently, this, I don't know whether you read, there was quite a lot in the press the other day at the coronation thing. Thousands of football fans going to asking why, why the Champions League music was being played at the coronation. So I was going to ask you about that because, <laughs> yeah, as you obviously as you say, the, the uh, Zidok the priest Handel's composition was was originally for was it George II's coronation? Yeah, in seventeen twenty seven. I've got it written down here. That's not off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm guessing a lot of football fans won't realise if they listen again. They go, well, it's not the same. And I have been unfairly accused of stealing it, and and don't be no. My answer is like, well, I get the I get the royalties from. <laughs> <laughs> so well, that's quite an apt topic, isn't it? On the pop side of things, Ed Sheeran yeah. in the in the press recently for a couple of court cases, where he's successfully defended himself as well, hasn't he? Because yeah. you know, as creatives, of it's course. a case of borrowing and building on, and of and I think it is. Of course, yeah. I mean, in fact, I was doing an interview earlier, and I was making the point that. Everything evolves. I mean, so you could call it stealing or you could say, but, you know, some of Mozart sounds exactly like Haydn. And some of Beethoven, early Beethoven sounds like Mozart. What are we talking I'm not putting myself in the league of those guys, but you know what I mean. It's like, it's a nonsense. What we found was a middle ground whereby people who didn't understand music could say, oh, I like that. And that was it. Well, then I said to them, well, okay, so where are the words? 
I really do remember that. They said, well, words, words? I said, well, we're not going to sing it to la, are we? Well, maybe you want to sing it to la. It's going to sound a bit stupid. So, so they didn't um, give you the words then? No, they said, well, what do you suggest? I said, well, look. What are we trying to say? And that was when we got into the the real meat of it, which was the very interesting part, which is what are we trying to do with this music? I mean, you have to bear in mind, I don't think the word brand was ever used in our discussions. And I was working mainly with a guy called Craig Thompson, who's American, not from a soccer background, from a sports marketing background, who was running team marketing and who's still a dear friend. And it became clear that what we were trying to do with the whole thing, not just the music, but with the the graphics, the star ball, the way of presenting it, was twofold. The important bit was, and I think it's to UEFA's credit, that they wanted to restore the beautiful game to being a beautiful game because it had got pretty ugly. You know, the hooliganism, it was really bad. And they were determined that they were going to make this a class act, you know. So that was really important to them. And the other thing was, and this is where we were on the nursery slopes, was this notion of branding, although we didn't really use the word, a sports competition, pan-European, but actually making it completely branded and owned by one group. This was kind of early days with it. And But in, in terms of the first point, it took me longer to have the conversations than to write the music. My experience is that if it's going to happen, it, for me anyway, it happens really fast. I mean, I can write really fast. in, And that's probably all those years of, you know, writing stuff in the taxi on the way to the studio. <laughs> but it was kind of, it became very clear that we would we wanted this thing to have grandeur, to have seriousness. So I just... I wrote down a whole load of superlatives, the best, the greatest, the most exciting, the fastest, well, whatever. I've still got them somewhere. (laughs) And then I employed a a, a multilingualist because it's it's three, the official UEFA languages are English, German, and French. So I just got him to translate literally all those phrases into French and German, and then I kind of whisked them around, and the rest, as they say, is history. The lyrics are essentially those superlatives that you've mentioned, but yeah. then just translated into German and, and, and French. Yeah. And German friends of mine tell me that they kind of don't make total sense. And I say, well, who cares? I mean, it's, you know, it's... Oh, really? What, what are the, what are the well, Germans? Well, I don't know. I think sometimes some Germans feel that the, um, the translations are too literal. Well, right. You wouldn't say that. And I say, well, it fits with the music, so it's fine. No. Yeah, creative license. Absolutely. There really wasn't a lot of to and fro, but... Now, here's the thing. The reason there wasn't, and we, we had a big party in Lucerne last year with all the people from team marketing. Craig reminded us that the actual signing of the contract was in early April 1992 when Gerard Aigner, who was the chief executive of UEFA, and uh, Leonard Johansson, or Mr. Johansson, as I always called him because he was, was a gentleman, uh, who was the, you know, the, the president. They finally signed it off. They said, okay, guys, Let's try it. Let's risk it. Let's do it. And we need it all by November, by the first matches. Well, I mean, these days, you wouldn't even get to your first focus group by then. So there was a time issue. The graphics, the whole TV package, the whole, you know, it's a big deal. It's a lot to get done. They've lasted the test of time, and that's the thing. I sometimes wonder in this day and age whether these creative agencies, when they put all these extra steps in and focus groups and they just beat the hell out of it to the point where 18 months down the line there's still something not being delivered. Oh. But when you've got that time constraint and you've just got to produce something, sometimes that's just the best way forward. Oh, I, I don't think, in my, in my opinion, there's no doubt about it. But you see, what was a kind of experiment has now... You know, sports branding has become a multi, multi million pound business. And it's all very interesting. But the truth is that there are a layer and layer of middle management people who are kind of, it's, it's the, it's a self perpetuating thing that goes on. And 
I think it's quite often creatively detrimental and also kind of insulting as well. I mean, you know, if I were to, if I was talking to some people at UEFA about it the other day, nowadays, one would have to pitch for everything. UEFA, obviously, when they, they launched the Europa League, they sort of rebranded UEFA Cup a few years ago. And with that, they, they produced a, an anthem to go alongside it. Did they not ask you? I thought they would have gone... No, we, there was kind of there's been rather a cooling with UEFA, although it's warmed up again recently. I mean, I think they've done yet another survey specifically about the music, which, surprise, surprise, you know, would you like to keep the music as it is? And it's like that they were surveying the broadcasters, fans, clubs, players, the lot. It was like 90% said, yeah, don't touch it. So it's like they have to be kind to me, really. But so going back to uh, you're right to point out that because I think a lot of people forget, given the glitz and glamour of the Champions League and and, and the Premier League, what football was like in 1992. You you mentioned that context that you know there was still hooliganism. The game was a bit grubby. Stadiums were crumbling, and even when the Champions League was launched, as you say, there was only a handful of teams, and those that were in it were shock horror champions of their, of their yeah. domestic league, which, you know, these days you don't need to pay to, to get an invitation. What were the expectations at the time? When you, when you handed in this, this, this anthem to UEFA, what did you think was going to happen? What did UEFA think? I'm guessing nobody anticipated that 30 no, years down the line. No, I don't. Think. I mean, I recorded it, orchestra in the morning, choir in the afternoon. It took longer to do the versioning. Because in those days, you know, now you'd send a WAV file. But in those days, I had to book a separate studio for a week to run off. One broadcaster wanted quarter-inch stereo, non-Dolby. One wanted mono, non-Dolby. One wanted Dolby. One wanted DAC. Oh, God, it, it was a whole week of it. <laughs> At the end, there was this huge pile in the foyer of the studio of different tapes waiting to be picked up by the couriers. And it was all very last minute. I mean, I think we all felt something was happening. And certainly when we got the music recorded, I thought, oh, actually, this could be quite good. This just kind of has that feel. I mean, it, it felt the vibe was very good. And I think that Team UEFA were really excited because I'd worked to the pitch. And that, I'm, I'm much better when I've got pictures to work to. And they, with that, by that time, they had put together a rough sort of assembly of, of that whole Star Ball sequence and, the, you know, the stadium thing, which hasn't really changed. I mean, it gets changed every three years, but it's not, it's still got the same concept. I think there was a hope that it would certainly rejuvenate the competition, which had become pretty much more abundant, I recall. If you'd ask Agnia, who I think is still with us, actually, I think if you'd asked him, is this going to become the effectively the the biggest sporting competition in the world in terms of the fact that it happens every year for like eight months of the year, I think he would have said, don't, don't be crazy. It just hit the right spot. It's one thing getting the tick from, from the corporates from UEFA, but what the anthem manages to somehow do, which is the impossible of being able to unite the corporate, the footballers, and the fans. And obviously football fans are notoriously critical but most of them seem to have taken the anthem to their hearts. Yeah, it seems, apart from Man City. Of course. Yeah, good point. But I, I, yeah, what do you think about that when they build the anthem? I think they need to grow up. But there again, <laughs> they're football fans, you know. From what I understand, what they're actually booing is you. Originally, they were booing UEFA. And they were booing UEFA because of that whole pay cap thing, which was all a lot of bollocks, really. And, you know, it, but it, they were all so excited when Pep Guardiola came to them. And he must, they must have got really pissed off because I'm told that he publicly said to them, will you stop booing the anthem? It's yeah. just nonsense. Because he really likes it. I know that <laughs> for a fact. He thinks it's great. So even he can't stop them booing. I'm rather hoping that they will redeem themselves because I think they're probably going to win at Istanbul. In which case, I'd like them to sort of kind of, it's a mark of respect. Well, it will, it's, the, it's the real litmus test, isn't it, to see if they boo the anthem at the final in Istanbul. Yeah, exactly. You, know I mean? you boo the anthem uh, at the final, you deserve to lose, you <laughs> morons. <laughs> but you mentioned about Guardiola saying, you know, it's, did, has that, have you had much feedback directly from players and managers? That... Yeah, not directly, because I'm not in their exalted lifestyle. But a few years ago, they asked me to go and do a, a match night at Sky Germany. It was in at um, Munich, and Bayern Munich were playing in the group stage. And it was a kind of, it was 
it was a bit of a mind fuck because you know I don't speak German. I speak a few words of German, but certainly not conversational German. And so I'm being interviewed in English, and then I'm getting a simultaneous translation in my headphones, and the audience are getting a simultaneous translation. And it was, it was wild. And the other guest, with the, the sort of pundit, was Stefan Effenberg, who I had seen him a few years previously. And, of course, famously, he was a real toughy, real hard man. So anyway, he was chatting away, and, and I said to him, the last time I saw you, you were standing two metres from me in San Siro when Bayern Munich were playing Valencia, I believe, in the final. And... He said, oh, yeah, I was, yeah. And I said, you were very nervous. He said, no, I was not nervous. I said, well, I think you'll find you were. You were pretty shaky. I, I was that close to you. Oh, God, I was just getting in the zone. Whatever, mate. And, of course, the audience were loving it. And uh, But he did say, he said, listen, when, when you stand there in that lineup and you hear mm. that music, he said, every hair in the back of my neck stood up said it's the most exciting thing to hear because you he said you know you're here <laughs> you, don't, you don't got an option now you've got to play it was very sweet very funny we got on very well it was it was quite a fun evening actually there was that famous clip of, of cristiano ronaldo that went viral yeah. as well where he's just yeah. singing along like it's, a, it's the national anthem i went to my local news agents in holt and the young man said oh mr Britton, you've gone viral i i didn't know what he was talking about. i said oh what you know and he said haven't you heard and i said i don't know what you're talking about mate but you know and he said well ronaldo and i said well i've heard of him <laughs> he said he's singing your anthem he said you know x million people have oh <laughs> that's crazy you may have made several films about the music over the years and they interview people like messi and that they all do feel that it uh, i think it's it's that thing of I know these guys get hideously overpaid, but the pressure is significant. And certainly Stefan was saying that, you know, it's like you can be as good as you like, but suddenly it's in another world. It's because of the money and the expectation. So it's kind of nice if they feel that the music gives them a leg up. Back shortly to my conversation with Tony, where I'll get nosy about royalties and hear an unexpected story involving pimps in Milan. But first... A word about our unsung charity partner. Leading social care charity Community Integrated Care deliver 10 million hours of care annually to people with learning disabilities, autism, mental health concerns, dementia and complex care needs. Their revolutionary inclusive volunteering model sees a partner with sporting events like the Rugby League World Cup and UEFA Women's Euro, enabling thousands with complex barriers to enjoy sport. To find out how you can work with the charity or access their support, visit communityintegratedcare.co.uk. Now back to the interview, where we discuss the European Super League and find out what it's like to have Micah Richards and Jamie Carragher on backing vocals. Have you managed to get to many Champions League games off, off the back um, of that then? I used to do quite a few. I used to actually do the on-pitch stuff, but then they stopped me and started using other people. And that, The last time we went to San Siro was five years ago. When I took my wife, she'd never been to a football match. And that, she loved it, the IP seats and all that, and then all the hospitality. And well, mind you, it all went wrong because <laughs> hospitality didn't go as far as getting us a car to get back to our hotel. And then the San Siro grounds way out of Miller. In the end, we set off walking. And she was wearing these silly shoes. And I was crazy. We couldn't get any lift. And then uh, one of the ex team guys, we bumped into him and he, he said, I can't get a cab or anything. And then he saw this minivan ahead that he figured was a, probably a, some sort of taxi or something. So he ran up there and he said to the guy, luckily, you know, he's Italian, this deep, and so he's an Italian, and, can you give us a lift into town? He wasn't a cab driver, he was a driver. And it turned, so he said, well, you'll have to, I'll have to do a couple of pickups first. And we said, that's fine, whatever. Yeah. And what <laughs> we didn't realise was that he was picking up some hookers. Oh, Christ. He was, a, he was a pimp. A <laughs> pimp who also wrote music. And Stephen was trying to persuade this guy that we were kosher. And so he said, this man here, Tony, he's very famous. He wrote the music for the Champions League. Wow, did he? Listen, I've got to play some of my music. So we had this barrage of this terrible music. And then we stopped. And then these two rather 
eccentric ladies of the night hopped in and then we dropped them off and then we picked another one up. I mean, that's, of all the stories I thought you might have come up with today, getting in a pimp's van was not what I was expecting. <laughs> no, not what we were expecting, I can tell yeah, you. sounds it, yeah. We, we dined out on it for many a year. But what was the experience like being on the pitch, performing in front of football fans? That was great. I mean, the San Siro one, that was very interesting because we'd seemed... That whole thing with the opera of the Caccia, the, the, you know, the opera of football. All the on-pitch entertainment was opera-based, which was a bit of a risk. But you are in, in Milan. Even, you know, ordinary Italians love opera. Unfortunately, all, ordinary Germans, well, ordinary Germans should, but they don't always. Anyway, we, <laughs> it was kind of really over the top and great fun. And we had various, I remember the opera babes had their christening on the pitch, and of course, they went down like a cup of cold shit. They weren't, <laughs> fans weren't interested whatsoever. They were in the middle of the pitch, you couldn't see them. They weren't even on the Jumbotron, you know. It's like, what are they doing there? And then I had said we should feature the chorus of La Scala Milan. And there was an awful lot of horse trading because La Scala was being difficult. We're in Italy, of course it's going to be difficult. And, they, you know, then they, local people, local management suggested some other choir. And I said, you know what, why don't you just let me talk to the guys at that scale? No, 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 we're doing it. Oh, okay. And then I think you'll know what's going to happen. In the end, we did manage to intercede and we got the chorus of La Scala, which was pretty cool. And in those days, of course, it was better to have stand microphones. So there were like 60 of them. So there was like 30 stand mics had to be got on and off the pitch in like 37 seconds or whatever it was, you know. The, the quid pro quo was they were going to do a solo bit. So they did Va Pensiero, the, the March of the Hebrew Slaves, da, 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 which in Italy, of course, is like we are the champions, you know. And they were going to do it unaccompanied because we didn't have an orchestra because we were for the singing the actual Champions League anthem, we had a pre recorded orchestra. And it was getting a bit riotous. And some of the Bayern Munich fans had had a bevy or two more than they possibly should have done. Perhaps they weren't used to the Italian beer or something. I don't know. And the idea was that I think La Scala were going to come on like 20 minutes before the kickoff. So quite near. By which time there's 80,000 people going ape shit. And I don't know whether you've ever been to San Siro. I mean, it's a scary place because it's so steep and the sound is huge. <laughs> this very worried senior chap from UEFA came rushing over and he said, you're going to have to cancel. You have to just... They can't come on. It's just going to be a disaster. And I said, well, too late, mate. He said, no, no, I'm, I insist. I said, no, I insist that you don't. Because I think it's going to work. And if it doesn't, what are you going to do? I mean, I got really pissed off, actually. I just thought, this is this is making me look like a break, you know? What was he worried about? We just worried that the fans would all boo or shout or whatever. And I thought, well, if they do, they do. Anyway, they came on. They started to sing. And they you know, the noise died down very rapidly to the point where the only ones that were making them kicking off, pardon the pun, were the Bayern Munich fans down my end who were still hadn't noticed what was going on and they were shamed into, into silence. And do you know, they ended up singing in almost total silence. I mean, how cool is that? I have to say, I was very scared, but it just goes to show you these... They loved it. They thought it was wonderful. The fans just thought, hey, what well, else? Somebody's done something special for us. You know, That's a cool you know. thing as well to be able to say, isn't it? That you silenced the, the San Siro. Yeah. But then when we got to the actual anthem, I mean, that was really scary because they had to come back on again with their microphones and all that. And we had it all, you know, we'd rehearsed it a lot. In the afternoon, the early afternoon, I'd done a sound check and I'd said to the sound guys, I said, you know, any louder than that, I'm going to have it on the fold back. Because again, this is before the days of in ear monitoring. I said, if it's any louder, I'm going to have a nosebleed. When we got to it, the noise of the crowd was so intense, I didn't hear the introduction bar of the orchestra. Luckily, the sound guys were smart. I was turned round in absolute panic, just went Whoa, up, and they shoved it up even higher. And the whole choir, I just, I, I made a gesture, you know, jump half a bar. And the whole choir jumped with me. I don't think anybody ever noticed, other than me and probably the choir, and I yeah. was shitting it. You know. And that was uh, 
testament to you insisting on having Las Gala come in. Yeah, they were they the showed real their class. Business. They really did show their class by because you know if we hadn't have jumped, it would have just been indescribably bad. Yeah. <laughs> You might have followed the story about the European Super League that they were trying to, to launch. Yeah. I'm assuming you're dead against that, given that you mentioned oh. earlier you get royalties. Bloody right, yeah. <laughs> dead against it because of the royalties, but dead against it because I think it's a terrible idea. There was a sense now that the major clubs, I know this from bits and bobs I hear, have far too much, I, in my humble opinion, far too much control over how UEFA behave and the decisions that are made. But Better that they're in the fold. Embrace your enemy and all that. The thought of an American-style Super League where you were best members of the club, I mean, what a ludicrous idea. I mean, for everyone, literally everyone. And I was so impressed that the fans just said, no, and enough. And they said it. I mean, God, they got very organised. I mean, very militant, very quickly. I thought that was brilliant. And actually, though I despise this government, they were pretty good on that occasion. I mean, everybody just said, no, this is one step too far. And and it was only, what, a matter of days. I mean, it humiliated the big boys. It does show, though, that mass protest can still have that uh, instant impact. It was almost only took a a, a day or two and the whole thing was shelved, wasn't it? I mean, the sad thing is that, that something happened, but it's football. We did mass protest about leaving... Brexit and didn't bloody work at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, careful, careful. We slip into that conversation. We'll be here all day, I think. Oh, well, don't, <laughs> don't, don't get me going. All right. I'm going to be really nosy now then. Royalties, because I noticed the other day that the anthem is on Spotify yeah. um, with your name attached. It's, it says Champions League full anthem, Tony Britton, and it's had over six million listens. So, do you it? get couple of pennies well, every time then, uh, someone listens. Well, I, I don't get much from Spotify. I better get my publishers onto that. You should, yeah. Yeah, six million. I, I'm writing that down. Bastards. Yeah, yeah. I'll take my 10% just for <laughs> pointing it out. You do get royalties, though. For... I get, well, I get the main royalties are from broadcast. And that changes. I mean, I've never had a penny from Russia. Never had a penny from China. Shock. No shit, you know, yeah. Tell <laughs> some Yeah. Um, and royalties from um, BT Sport are minimal. I mean, they're... They bleat away, but oh, it cost us all this money to license it. Well, then give some gear creative. It's not as good as it was because it's so much more of it now is OTT, you know, is, is online. And the, the money from online is it's getting there, but it's, it's, it's not great. Uh, but yeah, you know, I'm not complaining. I'm not a millionaire, but I earn, you know, a nice amount from it. And what it's done is it's enabled me to invest in projects that I want to do that. I've almost invariably lost me money. But projects that I feel need to be films about music or album projects, particularly on the film side. You're obviously still you're still getting a lot out of being associated with the anthem. Do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy speaking to people like me? Or does it, after a while, you kind of like, I'm a bit sick of talking about well, it? This is an interesting format because it's a little bit less interview-like. So I have done a lot of interviews over the years and I'm always happy to do them because... It's kind of looking after the gig, you know. The truth is, it's a new story for a lot of people. And it's, you know, it's an interesting one. So um, they've not invited you out this time then? No, no, they haven't. No. I mean, they're, they're happy. I mean, CBS have taken it over in the States. It was with Turner, and they were doing absolutely nothing with it. And CBS would take, and they're really putting in a lot of muscle. The CBS are good like that. If they decide to make something work, it will work. And yeah, I mean that that's that's making waves over in the UK as well because yeah. they've got they've got Micah Richards, they've got Jamie Carragher, Thierry Henry on the panel, and they're always doing these daft virals. And well, we, yeah. I did one with Mike, Micah Richards. They've got a whole studio down in West London, and the guy that runs it, Chris Slava, he's creative director. CBS Sports. I mean, he's a grand fromage, and he briefly became my best friend, you know. And he was great. He just said, Listen, can you come and do the match today and play the music? Oh, God, I had to sit around for hours, and it's a dry studio. I thought, oh, I don't mind sitting around, I'll just go and have a drink, you know, but it wasn't to be. So that was fun, and they all sat around and sang the anthem, and it was, it was ridiculous. But he's great. I mean, he's bonkers.
Do you ever get asked to play at the parties? No, um, and I make sure that I, I, I don't do that full stop. I, I for many years now, I said, you know, Lord, I'm on, I'm on my holes here. A terrible thing where people say, "Oh, you play the piano?" Yes, I do. Well, give us a tune. Why? Well, what What do you do for a living? Well, I'm a banker. Right. Well, give me some money then. <laughs> <laughs> thing is, though, you, you say that, but if there's ever a guitarist at a party, they can't wait to get their guitar out. You say it's different with pianists, is it? No, it's just different with me. I'm just grumpy. Right. You know. <laughs> Fair and then also, I'm not brilliant at busking stuff. I mean, I'm always in awe of people who can say, well, yeah, what tune, what key do you want to just do play? I mean, I can play stuff, but no, I'd, I'd rather be quietly in the corner. Yeah, and have a drink. And have a drink, yeah. Unless you're in a CBS studio. Unless you're in is... a CBS studio, in which you just fret, you know. <laughs> <laughs> If you'd like to find out more about what Tony's up to these days, you'll find the links to his production company and arts channel in the episode show notes. There's also a Spotify link to the full Champions League anthem if you fancy doing your best Cristiano Ronaldo impression. If you'd like to make our jobs a little easier and you know of anyone with a unique perspective from behind the scenes of elite sport, get in touch with a recommendation for a potential future unsung interview or story. Just head to unsungpodcast.com where you can suggest a guest. My thanks again to Tony Britton for speaking to me for this podcast which was produced by Matt Cheney artwork is by Matt Walker and the executive producer is Sam Barry my name is Alexis James thanks for listening and catch you next time on Unsung.